because it's a very important truth that I want to share with you. Each, uh, each of these lessons, uh, we're trying to make them as vital as we can. Uh, the next trimester will be packed every, in every lesson in order to get through this wonderful book, Healing the Sick, that we're using as our textbook. Today, we're going to discuss uh, chapter 39 on the seven redemptive names of God. Uh, this is going to be a very important study, and I believe that it will uh, have a great effect upon your faith and your ministry. Uh, before I go to this uh, study today, I want to read something that happened in the Bible, then I want to read something that happened in our lives. In the third chapter of Acts, Peter and John went up into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, and a certain man... Uh, lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, Paul teaches us in Philippians that God has given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth, angels, uh, human beings, and demons will bow to the name of Jesus. Now, this has meant a lot to me in my life, and I hope it'll mean a lot to you. Now, I want to take you over to Nakuru, and I want to share with you some of what God did there. Now, let me say again, the reason I'm sharing this with you is so that you will understand that nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible to take place in your ministry. God is with you. He's with you in His Word. His Word cannot return to Him void. When you take His Word and go minister, you take Him with you in the ministry. He is the minister. He is the life. He is the power. It is him that does the work. <clears throat> I have no right to take glory uh, when, when I pray for someone and a wonderful miracle takes place. Then I have no right, more right to do that than do I have the right to be discouraged Sometimes when I don't see visibly all that I want to see. I have one job to do. I'm privileged to do one thing, I should say, and that is to share the word of life. To proclaim the gospel, to give the word, that puts God to work. My job is to plant the seed. All of the seed does not fall on perfect ground. All of the ground is not perfect but we're to cast it out and let it fall where it will. That's what we do in these great crusades. We're doing it right now to you. Every one of you can be good ground if you take the seed and believe it in utter simplicity. Uh, every time I share with you in one of these lessons some of what we have witnessed, I realize I'm doing it at the risk of someone saying, well, what's he telling us all of these miracles that's happened for? I'm telling you because I want you to know that these days that I share with you are like reading the book of Acts. And I think it's good for people to hear that God is still conducting himself exactly the same as he did in the book of Acts, for exactly the same reasons. I believe that's heavy. I believe that's important. I notice in the, in the Old Testament, often, when some great miracle would take place, I notice God would say, now, write that. Write that down. Record that. Maybe he'd say, make an altar or make a monument so that when, when your children come by, you'll tell them this. I believe God wants his miracles to be noted and read in the hearing of people to encourage them. Now, hearing a miracle won't build faith. 
Hearing God's word is what builds faith. But hearing that God is doing the same things today as he did in Bible days is an encouragement to know that if you or if I take God's word at face value and proclaim it and minister in the name of Jesus, depending on him, he hasn't changed. That's why I share these things with you. It happened in Nakuru. The whole town is talking. We're hearing of wonderful things that took place last night in the meeting. At the far edge of the crowd, a woman was born blind. She had never seen in her life. She was suddenly healed. As she began to see, she became so frightened that she screamed aloud and started to run. Then she saw a car moving and it horrified her. She became frantic. She was just a poor village woman who had never seen in her life. Seeing masses of people moving about, she was horrified. Her husband uh, ran after her to calm her. She knew his, he called after her to calm her. She knew his voice and turned to him. But seeing him coming toward her, she screamed and turned and ran, and he finally had to tackle her, catch her, and hold her in order for her to overcome the shock that came from receiving her eyesight. Zechariah Gichohi, a leading Christian businessman in, uh, in Nakuru, uh, knows about this case. There was a, then another blind woman was sitting in the car at the edge of the multitude. The husband was standing by the rear of the car. His wife was totally blind. When the prayer was finished, the woman opened her eyes and her blindness was gone. She was so shocked and overwhelmed that she shouted out loud, almost fearfully, and jumped out of the car and called for her husband. When he rushed to her and saw what had happened, he fell on his face on the ground, weeping and crying out to the Lord. Wonderful, isn't it? Wonderful. God does those things today, the same as in the Bible. Ishmael, one of the main ushers here, and many local Christians saw this woman healed and verified it as she came to testify. Then over in another section of the, of the crowd, Ishmael, who operates one of the mobile evangelism units we've placed here in Kenya, had been watching a lad with terribly crippled feet. They turned up so that he walked on the sides of his feet, of his ankles. All of a sudden, after the prayer, the boy's feet straightened out and he could stand upright on them. Both feet were flat and he was healed. Ishmael took him and tried for over an hour to get the lad to the platform, but could not get even near. So great was the press of the multitude. The boy will come today and testify, Ishmael has told us. I'm writing this the day following. Pastors have been coming to our room all day with new reports of miracles that are taking place. The Finnish missionary here with two of our interpreters came into our room almost out of breath. They've been over on Collingen Street and the police are having to forcibly open a way through the crowd in the streets so the cars can pass. Because a four-year-old child who was born totally blind received sight last night and the street is jammed by people who are amazed looking at this child. The mother of the child is there showing everyone. What is overwhelming the people is that many of them know the child and confirm the mother's words that it was born with a white film on its eyes so thick that it seemed like a skin. Now the film has disappeared and the child is seeing everything clearly. Isn't that wonderful? The power of the word of Jesus Christ just proclaimed over an audience of people. These are the kind of things that happened. While I have been writing this, they brought the child to the hotel for us to see, and it's absolutely amazing what is happening to the boy's eyes. It is a creative miracle. One of the hotel men came and said to Daisy's interpreter, I must go today and get my wife from the village. I was standing in the meeting last night, and my own eyes witnessed a great miracle. A woman who was born blind suddenly received her sight. She screamed and tried to run from everyone and from everything that moved, and they had to catch her and hold her. I saw it with my own eyes. It was the case that I had uh, told about before. Then one of the missionaries pointed, pointed out of the hotel window to a woman who was sitting on the wall out by the road in front of the hotel. A group was with her. 
We just received word of her miracle last night. She had been crippled in both legs and could barely manage to move about. Her knees were bent and turned inward so that they had to be forced around each other. She could scarcely walk at all. She had to shuffle herself by moving her legs below her knees. Balancing her weight with a heavy stick, last night the woman was healed. God literally straightened out her bones. They brought her to the hotel to show us the miracle. It's absolutely awesome. Her legs are well. It's a marvel to see the woman showing the crowd that gathered around the hotel what God had done for her. Her legs are restored. They're normal. The first miracle that reached the platform last night was the lad with crutches, a lad with crutches and steel braces on his legs. He and his mother came to the hotel today and gave us the most wonderful testimony. The boy was a healthy 11-year-old lad who went to school. Then he was in a car accident. His right leg was broken above the knee, and after the cast was removed, he fell and broke it again and broke the left leg too. They put both legs in casts up to his waist. Then they discovered that he had a bone disease which made them brittle and weak. For three months, he had lain flat in bed. In boarding school, he was finally able to walk again by using two crutches. Then he fell and broke his right leg again. One more time he spent three months in a cast. That time, the feeling in his, that time the feeling in his leg was gone and it seemed to be dead. A creeping paralysis had set in and there seemed to be no life in his legs. Again, he was put on crutches, but both legs had to be fitted to steel braces. Even so, he could hardly swing his legs along without, without he could hardly swing his legs along. Without the supports, he could not bear weight or take a step. But last night, he took off his braces, handed his crutches to his mother, who gave them to me. Then the lad walked all over the platform, back and forth, while the multitude marveled. Oh, how happy he was. Today, the joy is even greater, as every hour he's gaining strength. Praise the Lord. We're really seeing Bible days. I wonder what else we'll hear about before this day is over. Now, I hope as you hear something like that, you'll say, thank God, Brother Osborne. Thank God that you've shared that with us. Thank God we know Jesus is unchanged today. Now, here's what I want to share with you. You see, we go out to, in these crusades, we go out, all the time, spend our life doing it. And people always marvel. They seem to feel that we have some special faith. No, we do not have, but we know some special facts. I believe that when you know what I know, you'll have the same faith that I have or greater. Why not? I'm not conscious of having faith. I know certain facts. I almost would say, I don't think about needing faith. I think about remembering facts. I want to share seven facts with you today, if I can. One day I was reading my Schofield Bible. I decided to read it through. I got over to page six and seven in the Schofield Bible. And in his footnote on the redemptive names of Jehovah, I made some wonderful discoveries. Now, let, let me explain it to you if I can. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, for the first time, the Bible says, calls him the Lord God. Up until that, throughout the creation process, he's called God, 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 God. Then, bang, here you come to chapter 2, verse 4, he's called the Lord God. Lord in all caps. Isn't that strange? 
Why? Now, human beings are going to be created. Now, Adam and Eve are going to be created. The animals have been created, the water has been created, the light has been created, the trees have been created, the vegetation has been created, the mountains, all of that's been created. God, God, Elohim, God, El, Elah, Elohim, God. Then we get ready to create man and woman. And bang, like that, chapter 2, verse 4, it says, the Lord God. What'd that mean? Lord, the English word of the Hebrew word Jehovah. Jehovah or Yahweh. Lord in English. Lord. What does it mean? Lord. Before Elohim, his being, the eternal one, Lord, what does it mean? The self-existent one. Jehovah is formed from the root Hava, H-A-V-A-H, which means to become, or to become known. Now listen, get this. That is, in other words, God, God, Elohim, Jehovah, continually and increasingly revealing himself. That's very important that you learn this. The idea of all this is Lord God, Jehovah Elohim, Elohim, deity, God. But Jehovah, as though it's qualifying God, Jehovah, the Lord God, God in his characteristic, in his characteristics, which he reveals to people. Now, you say, what does that mean, brother? Why are you all worked up about that? Well, <clears throat> God, deity, has now come to create man and woman, and now he introduces his name Jehovah, the self, -rev the revealing one, the one that's going to show himself to these people that he's going to create and on down through to you and me. Uh, it, 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 it means the special relation of deity in his Jehovah character as it relates to human beings in a revealing process. Does that help you? Okay, now, I said all this to help you understand. All the Bible supports this. God in his characteristics known as Jehovah, reveals himself and makes himself known to us. Jehovah, a redemptive name, the redemptive name of deity. Now, uh, I, I find it, I, I'll just throw this in, it, it's interesting to me that uh, that in this first chapter, it's God, 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 God. Then he gets ready to create man and woman, and it's Lord God. Lord God. Aren't you glad he's Lord? And as Lord, he reveals himself. How? I'll show you the seven ways. Now, what's interesting about this that I was just going to throw in for good measure? You go on down then, and it's all Lord God, Lord God, Lord God. He created Adam and Eve, Lord God, Lord God, everything Lord God. Until you get down here where Satan comes in the garden to tempt them. It's not Lord God. He says, God. He won't call him Lord. Just God. And what will shock you is to find then that Adam and Eve 
bending to the temptation, make the same mistake. They don't call him Lord, they just say God. Don't you see the root of the problem? Okay, I can't get on that. That's another whole, that's another whole study. But I wanted to throw that in for good measure. Now, in this, this Jehovah, Lord, God. I mean, God, God, that's big. God created the heavens and the earth and did all that. But when he becomes Lord God, I can learn about him. Because Lord Jehovah God is, is the, the aspect of God, the characteristics of God, his way of coming and revealing himself. So, throughout the Bible, he reveals seven times. He reveals himself seven times and gives seven names, always redemptive names, the Lord names, seven of them. Why seven? Because seven is a perfect number, of course, a complete number. Our, all of the needs of humankind are seven. God comes to reveal himself in all seven aspects of our lives. Isn't that wonderful? So that in every aspect of our life, every area of need in our lives, God, the Lord God, God comes into that aspect as Lord and reveals himself in that area, making us like him in that area, so that we never live in need. We live with Jehovah. He is our source. So we don't know need. We know abundance. Teach that. Believe that. Preach that. Tell that. Let's take them. Number one, Jehovah Shammah. Jehovah Shammah. What does that mean? That sounds like Hebrew or something. Who, who cares about Jehovah Shammah? I don't. I don't, I don't, I don't teach this most times. I, I put it in this book. But, but it's a wonderful truth. You say, Osborne, how do you go out and have all these crusades? How, oh, what great faith. No. Not great faith. I just know some great facts. I know Jehovah Shammah. Well, I'm not running around uh, uh, talking, uh, using these Hebrew words. That would drive people up the wall and across the ceiling and down the other side. Uh, you know, if we're going to talk Hebrew, let's go to Israel. <laughs> going to talk Greek, let's go to Greek. Let's go to Greece. Let's talk English. I'm French, I'll talk French. If I'm in France, I'll talk French. I'm here talking to you, I'll talk English. So, Jehovah Shammah means the Lord, our peace. Excuse me. The Lord is present. Okay, how did this come about? Well, in Ezekiel 48, verse 35, we find... A prophetic vision of the city of heaven. And among all of the details that Ezekiel saw about this wonderful abode that we have with God, the big thing that he emphasized was the Lord is there. In Hebrew, Jehovah. Shama. Now, his abiding presence with his people is a redemptive blessing. Now, what do I mean by what do I mean by that? I mean by a redemptive blessing. A redemptive blessing 
is a blessing that has been purchased for us. Redeem. Redemptive. Redeem. Redeem is a word in English that means buy back. God has, bought a, has created us, then redeemed us. He created us well and strong, perfect, happy, healthy. Satan came. We fell under the temptation, turned away from God, didn't believe in him, were driven out from the presence of God, broke the covenant, and were lost. God loved us too much to leave us like that. He redeemed us. How? By sending Jesus, the innocent, to die for the guilty. Jesus took our place, redeemed us. Jesus, he redeemed us by, pay, he got us out of debt by paying our debt for us. You don't pay a debt but once. Uh, you don't punish a crime. He, he relieved us from all judgment for our sins and our crimes by being punished for our crime and you don't punish the same crime twice. I emphasize that because I don't know of any truth that's more important for the world to know than that. You don't punish the same crime twice. We sin, we should die. We don't have to. Why? He died for us. You don't kill a man twice for the same crime. If Jesus died in my place, I'm free. Now that's the good news. So, I spend my life telling people that. Now, I'm th uh, the, you see, the, I find the most difficult thing to get clear to people and the most profound thing in the Bible is this idea that Jesus assumed our guilt, endured our punishment, paid our price, and he did it when we didn't even know we needed help. So he didn't do it because we cried and begged him to. He did it because he loved us. God loved us. God loves us, values us. He don't want us to die. He wants us to have everything that he is. So in our seven needs, the seven aspects of life, God, Jehovah, comes to us and reveals himself in these seven ways. Now, since Jesus bore our punishment, assumed our guilt, paid our price, endured our judgment. Now listen, listen. Therefore, there is no judgment ever waiting for you if you believe on Jesus Christ. Everybody in the world thinks they're going to go to judgment. People are scared. Christians are scared. I'm going to go to judgment. Someday I'll stand before God. Sure but not to be judged for your sins. I have that good news to tell you. If we would, we'll be there to get our rewards, but never to be judged for our sins if we trust in Jesus Christ. If we have to face our sins, then Jesus died in vain. If we have to be judged for our sins, then Jesus was judged in vain. He died in vain. He didn't die in vain. He did it for me. I accept it. I claim it. I receive it. No judgment for T.L. Osborne. I'm not guilty. Nothing I ever did is held against me. I'm free. I think that's a wonderful truth. Now, now listen. Back to this first one. Shama. The Lord is there. The Lord is there. Now, I'm talking back to what I was saying about a redemptive blessing. A redemptive blessing is a blessing that has been included in redemption, redeeming us. When he bought us back legally, I haven't got time going that legally, from Satan, he bought us back. A redemptive blessing is a blessing provided in the death of Jesus. Now, get this. Whatever Jesus died for, how many did he do it for? Who did he die for? Everybody. Everybody. Every creature in the whole world, all nations, right? To the end of the world. Everybody. Redemption. The cross was for everybody. Okay, if it was for everybody, 
a redemptive blessing. We're talking about a redemptive blessing. We're talking about redemptive names. Redemptive means it's for everybody. Everybody, everybody, everybody. What it means is God wants everybody to be like he made Adam and Eve before the sin. They fell. They blew it. Satan took over. They were lost. All humanity, they're lost, sick, diseased, failing, scared. But God has redeemed us through Jesus Christ. There are seven redemptive blessings. Redemptive blessings were paid for at the cross by the blood of Jesus, our sacrifice. If they were paid for, if they're a redemptive blessing, then, then, then they're for everybody. And they're now. It's already happened. Jesus died. It's finished. It's now. So, a redemptive blessing, a redemptive name. God announced himself in that vision to Ezekiel, the Lord is there. You bet. Meaning, wherever people are, God is. That's a redemptive blessing. Now, back to what I said. Osborne, you go out, have these big crusades, you and Daisy. Oh, you got great faith. No, we know some great facts. We know the Lord is there. That's why them blind people get healed. Not because Daisy and I have great faith. But we teach them the Lord is there. A redemptive blessing. I hope I'm getting that through to you. The Lord is there. I think it's beautiful how he talked about it. it, it it's, it's so wonderful that, that he is there. Uh, Revelations 21.3 God himself shall be with them. Boy, we get to look into heaven. Isn't that beautiful? Revelation 7, 15. He that sits on the throne shall dwell among them. Yes. But being a redemptive blessing, he dwells here now. Now. The Lord is there. Praise the Lord. That's why Jesus said, Lo, I am with you all way. Ephesians 2, 13. He's with us because we are made nigh by the blood of Christ, a redemptive blessing. Jesus bought us back. Let's take the second one, Jehovah Shalom. The Lord, our peace. Now that's a terrific revelation. Here God comes down and, and over here to, uh, to uh, Israel, over here in the, in the wilderness, fighting the Midianites. Seven years they were under the Midianites. You find this in Judge chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. The Midianites, God's people, he brought them. Oh boy, I'm going to get to preaching now if I don't look out. I'm trying to teach. God brought them out of Egypt, out of slavery. And here they, now the Midianites were on them. And because they didn't obey and they didn't do what God wanted them to, and so they, they uh, the Midianites, so, so these people of God were hid in dens and caves and in the mountains, trying to hide from them Midianites and them Amalekites. And the Bible says, every time they would plant anything, these ites would go out and they would destroy their increase. That devil's still doing that to people, destroying the increase. And not only that, they left no sustenance. The devil don't want you to have anything. He wants you to be poor. He wants you to be in trouble. Israel was greatly impoverished. The devil still wants that. They cried to God. God sent a prophet. God told them, I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of bondage. I brought you up here and gave you the land. I am the Lord God. Don't be afraid. And he sent a, 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 an angel. And the angel came to a young fellow by the name of Gideon, who was thrashing some wheat. And, and the angel said, the Lord is with you. And Gideon, young and 
beautiful but innocent said, boy, if the Lord's with us, why has all this happened to us? And where's the miracles? And the angel said, go in this thy might. You'll save Israel. I've sent you. Gideon says, how I know? He said, bring an offering. He did it. Did it. He said, put it on that rock. The angel touched it. Consumed it. A sign. Gideon said, wow, boy, wow. And he built an altar and called it Jehovah Shalom. I am your peace. Here's a young man just like you and me, just like people in trouble. Out here, the devil's fighting him from every angle. But he realizes God, who brought him out of bondage, is with him and has power. His staff's in his hand. He can do anything. Gideon said, with that, I have peace. You see, God came and revealed himself. I am Jehovah. Shalom. I am your peace. You don't have to be scared. You don't have to be nervous. You don't have to be weak. You don't have to be impoverished. Be at peace. I'm with you. I've got power. I am God, Jehovah, peace. Now, you get the point? The Lord is our peace. Jesus said in John 14, 27, my peace I give unto you. Isaiah 53, 5, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Colossians 1, 20, he made peace through the blood of the cross. That's why I can walk out there on a platform before a field of people following other religions. The Lord, my peace. I don't have to be afraid of witch doctors. I don't have to be afraid of lepers, cripples, not anybody, not anything. The Lord is my peace. Tell that to the world. Share that with people. These are such goodies. You want another one? I don't look, don't look like I'm going to get them all to you, but we'll get all we can. And the third one, Jehovah Raya. The Lord is my shepherd. Psalms 23, 1. We need direction. We need guidance. God, deity, comes in the form of Jehovah, Rhea. I am your guide and shepherd and protector. You and I never need to make bum decisions. In business, in ministry, whatever. Run your antenna up. Listen to God. He is your shepherd. He meets that need of direction for you. Listen and you'll hear. Look and you'll see. Reach out and you'll touch. Hallelujah. Number four, Jehovah Jireh. Wow. Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide us sacrifice. Genesis 22, 14, when Abraham was going to offer up his son, Jehovah came there and said to him, I will meet that need. I am Jehovah Jireh. Jireh. The Lord will provide a sacrifice. Hebrews 9, 26. He put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. He is our sacrifice. He supplies our need. Everything we need is in him. Number five, Jehovah Nisi. Beautiful. The Lord, our banner, our victor, our captain. When did that happen? Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. 
it was when they were fighting those dear uh, Amalekites again, a type of the devil, uh, the flesh, the conflict was, uh, was, was of the Amalekites. Moses, he went up on a hill. He said to Joshua, take your crowd and go out there and fight them. Aaron and her and me will go to the mountain and we'll take the rod of God and you go fight. And he did. Moses held it up, but he got tired. When his hand went down, they lost the battle. When it went up, they won the battle. Aaron and her sustained his arms, held him up, held his arms up with the rod of the Lord until the going down of the sun, until they defeated the Amalekites. And Moses said, this calls for an altar. Wow! And he named it Jehovah Nisi. He is our captain. Meaning this, whenever there's a battle, whenever there's a problem, he's there. He is your victor. You are not meant to be defeated. You are meant to succeed. Teach it. Nobody should be defeated. Nobody should go down and defeat. Nobody. Never, never, never. We are made to win. You believe it? I'm so glad for that. Christ triumphed over principalities and powers. Colossians 2.15 He provided for us as our substitute the redemptive privilege of saying, Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15.7 Jesus gave us the redemptive blessing of always having the victory. The fourth one, Jehovah Sidkinu. I don't have time to go into it. The Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. And Jesus is our gift of righteousness. Romans 5, 17. And the seventh one, Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord, your physician. I am the Lord that healeth thee. That redemptive blessing was bought for us by Jesus who went to the cross and bore our sicknesses and our diseases for us so that he could give us his perfect help. Now, my friends, the idea is this. Each of these redemptive names that God revealed show a redemptive blessing that he wants us to have. He wants us to have always his victory. He is there. He's with us. We never are alone. He is our peace. We're never afraid. He is our shepherd. We're always guided. He is Jireh, our provider. We never have a need of any kind. We're supplied. He is our Nisi, our captain, our victory. We don't lose battles. He is our Sidkinu, our righteousness. He is our life, and we have no guilt in us. And he is Rapha, our healer. He is our help. We never need be sick. May God take these seven redemptive names and burn them in your memory. No, our crusades aren't great because we have great faith. Our ministry isn't great because we have great faith. It's because we know great facts. You know them, some of them. I share all of them I can with you. Oh, we have some wonderful ones coming up. The next lesson will be on confession. But today I want to say to you, these redemptive blessings are everybody's now. Whatever Jesus did on the cross, he did for everybody. It's a redemptive blessing. Just tell it to the people and encourage them to believe it. You believe it now and receive it. In the name of Jesus Christ, God is Jehovah, our Lord. And he comes to you to fill every need you can possibly have. May he impart this truth to you and may this truth set you free in Jesus' name. I'll see you next week. God bless you.